So without further ado, I want to open the 2024 Surface Operations Workshop by inviting J.P. Durr up. Uh, J.P., I didn't have a chance to, to just kind of remind him of our conversation from Friday, but um, so now, now, the, now he knows. Um, I just want him to give a quick one-minute um, snippet. As you know, I don't see Commodore Alverdi. Is Alverdi here? So, okay, so Alverdi on July 3rd of this summer in the very opportunistic way Alverdi is, right? He's underway. He gets a call on the radio, and it's 45 seconds away from him, and it's seven people. You heard the Admiral talk about it last night. Well, there were three people on board Alverdi's boat. Alverdi is coxswain, Lori Barfield is crew, and J.P. Durer as a trainee, and that's where I'll invite J.P. to give a quick one-minute synopsis on that. J.P. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Uh, J.P. Durer, and uh, as the OTO said, I I'm currently a trainee uh, with the uh, boat crew program. Oh, there's Commodore Ver Verdi right there. Good to see you. So, um, as the OTO said, uh, on, that, on that day, we um, happened to be in a position where we, we received the distress, uh, distressed vessel, and we went there. And, uh, you know, because of our training, and I'm going to back up, Previously, uh, you know, uh, Commodore Verdi was the coxswain that day. I'll see uh, Lori Barfield was the, um, the other crew member, and I'm the trainee. I'm the new guy on the boat. What, you know, how am I going to help, right? Well, ironically, the weekend before, uh, Chris Rosario and myself were actually out. I was a trainee. He was a boat crew. And we had this, this real teddy pair of a guy. He's a really nice guy named uh, Ron Mealy. And uh, so, so that... So that weekend before, I'm a new trainee. Believe it or not, Ron was drilling the heck out, drilling. We're sweating bullets and we're drilling and, you know, uh, on, on doing, um, you know, side toes, getting lines out, just drill, 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 drill. I'm the new guy. And uh, the following weekend, I got to go out as a trainee on uh, coming to Verdi's boat, and um, that incident happened. And when it came up, Coxon, coming to Verdi's throwing out the commands. Lori's getting to work, and uh, I'm like, boom, I knew exactly what to do. I, it was just muscle memory, and I kind of remember the event. I remember afterwards going, wow, that was amazing. We saved that family. But because of the drilling and the training that we do here, thank you very much, Ron, uh, it was automatic. I knew what to do, and it was a successful rescue. So I believe I just wanted to share that. So thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Actually, thank you so yeah. So yeah, I, I just wanted to really press upon the fact of you know, we train how we fight. We fight how we train if we practice perfectly, right? And that's what I want you guys to take away today. There's two things, standard and safety. The standard, right? We train often to the standard and beyond. To get the operational excellence award, you have to be perfectly hitting the standard, okay? So for this year, for now, start absorbing all this information, start sort of thinking about how when you're training, you know what, uh, let me get this right, because you never know when that call's gonna come. Al's out there operating and all of a sudden he got that call and darn it, that, that thing's 45 seconds away. <laughs> it's right there. But then he, 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 um, he basically arrived on that situation and capitalized on it, all right? He didn't say, oh shoot, well let me, let me go back to page three tech. You know, he, his, his instinct kicked in and, and they did it. And, and so to the point of <clears throat> Ron, you know, we, we joke with him, tongue in cheek, obviously, like, you know, but Ron only wants the best. Bob, everybody here only wants the best for, for the program. So that's, that's why we do what we do, because we want to see people succeed and we want to save lives the end of the day, right? So um, just wanted to share that. I think it was important to kick off this morning with that. So let's roll right into it. All right, so welcome 2024 Service Operations Workshop. This is required. Um, it does say in here, for those of you that just arrived late, that it's gonna be not so much um, a lecture, it's gonna be more interactive, but for the sake that we're, we're filming this, for the sake that we've got Bob and Ron up next to talk about their experience 
with being on this, um, this team that designed and, and helped to rewrite the, hand, the handbook and the quals guide, they can get into a little bit more detail on this. So again, safety, absolutely paramount to everything that we do, right? Annual currency tasks, we'll talk about those. Staying out of REYR and rework status, we'll talk about that. The auxiliary training handbook, <clears throat> the quals guide, the evaluation drill sheets, the color and vision check video, and the ox operations process guide. On the color and vision video, when that screen comes up, you can come up here with your cell phone, go to the, hit the picture mode, and you can scan that QR code. And if you haven't seen this video, I think I said this on Friday, if you're a division commander, you're a whoever, and you have somebody that's in your AOR, area of responsibility, and they're like, I want to be a boat crew member, and you give them that vision test and they don't pass, they can't be a boat crew member. So save yourself some heartache, some disappointment, and waste of time. Uh, they also have to be able to move around the boat freely. They have to be able to do all the duties and responsibilities of the job. Now, if it's a sticky situation, tricky situation, that's where I make my money. Reach out to me. I'll give you an example. There's an auxiliarist that lost an arm in Vietnam. I'm not going to say where he is. I'll try and save that privacy part. But um, he could actually anchor the boat. It was unorthodox. It wasn't like your general. Just because he had a disability didn't mean he couldn't do the job. So it doesn't always mean, hey, no, they can't be it. You know, we'll have, to, we'll have to weigh these certain situations. So, next slide. Okay, so we have the crew endurance management. That's going to be talked about. It is on the D11S.org website. If you haven't gotten into that manual, a lot of what our safety, mishap prevention, that type of thing derives out of this manual. And it's been a big... Um, a big uh, proponent of where the resources are coming from uh, for, that, for the handbook and some of the language in the process guide. So the operations, OX operations process guide, if you didn't know this, there's four of them, okay? Surface Ops is volume one. That replaced the OX operations um, manual, okay? Why? I think uh, Commodore, uh, what was his name, Fred, he, uh, he mentioned it. It's a lot easier to update policy and procedure. How many additions have come out on the training handbook? Anyone know in the last year and a half? Three, right? Wow. It took him 11 years, 12 years to rewrite it. Now we have three. Well, that's the whole point. We want to keep updating it, make it better, refine it, make it better. You can't do that when it's a manual. Why? Because it goes on the admiral's desk. And by the time it's ready to be reviewed, the admiral transfers to another unit, and then it has to start all over again. And by that time, there's 60 other changes that have to be implemented in it. So it's kind of a clever way. It's policy, even though it's a process guide, okay? Different from what I said on Friday with the guideline of 90 days for somebody who's a new member. That is not policy. That's a guide, okay? So I want to clarify that. Mishaps, the whole reason why we do our TCTRM training, the whole reason we do our NAVRLs, the whole reason we get plenty of rest, the whole reason we don't drink within 12 hours of getting underway, the whole reason we're not on medication that affects our cognitive, um, you know, our cognitive ability to, to operate um, in a professional manner is because we want to avoid a mishap, okay? Mishaps or any unplanned event, right, that caused problems. <laughs> they cause a lot of extra paperwork for me, a lot of extra paperwork for the Coast Guard, but they're not punitive. We're not trying to say, oh, look at you, you had a mishap. Um, and chances are, and I can tell you that, a bit about that SAMA, that's the Standard Auxiliary Maintenance Allowance. So when you put in patrol orders, the OIA approves it. You have energy account and you have a SAMA account, okay? One is for paying for the patrol orders, the other one is for the fuel cost associated with that, okay? Um, the Ox Scout, there's a QR code for that as well, so I'll have you come up here and, and scan your phone with that. Um, that's later in the slide. 
Response Directorate Articles and Surface Contacts uh, POCs, Point of Contacts. Next slide. Okay, ground rules. This workshop should be interactive, not all lecture. As we said, we're going to save our questions, comments, concerns until the end. But again, if you're patient, I think a lot of these questions will be answered, or most of these questions will be answered for you as we go through. Um, and, you know, sea stories are always good, but for the sake of it being a long weekend, for the sake of it that we have three other people that need to speak, and, you know, don't be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> the person that, that's holding everybody up with sea stories, all right? If you need to use the head or the bathroom, feel free. Um, if you need to get up and grab some water or coffee, feel free. We'll just keep plugging away and going. Same thing with sharing insights, all right? But if you have a real story, like I thought, you know, when I was talking with JP in the hallway on Friday, he mentioned, you know, man, I was sort of like, it, like, you know, I've got six children, but the, the situation was like, man, I didn't even like second guess myself. The training kicked in because that artificial stress, you know, boot camp does the same thing. That's all they're trying to do. It's a game. They want to make sure if the wind is blowing 40 knots and you can't hear your chief or your bosun or somebody screaming orders, well, of course it's going to be stressful. So they got to make sure that you understand and you can, you can deal with that environment because if you can't, this job is probably not so much for you, okay? Because that's just the way it has to be. Next slide. Safety is always the first priority. We know this, right? Um, do you know when, when the new handbook and crew, and crew guide came out, it was all about safety, right? We had the mishap that happened in 2015 in Florida, and the Coast Guard Office of Boating Safety said, we have to change this. Uh, a bunch of admirals got together and said, how are we going to do this? Well, when they started peeling back the onion, they found out that the Coast Guard Auxiliary was about 15 years behind in doctrine, policy, and procedure. Some of the requirements that was required of the auxiliary were ancient in the time of active duty. So they wanted to catch the auxiliary up. It's so important that you know that you can do your job the, the right way. And that's the whole point is you have to be safe because perception is reality. It's not that you do the mission. Listen to this carefully. It's not that you can do the mission, but it's how you do the mission that is the most important thing. If you're not being professional and you're not being safe, but you get the job done, sooner or later, something bad is gonna happen. You have to do it to the standard. And that's why we have standards. So safety and standards, you're going to hear me say that over and over and over again. And that ties into the ultimate goal that some of you have. And some of you, the Operational Excellence Award, not uh, sure. Everybody should have that in their, in, their, in their hindsight at some point. But that is not a requirement. And I will say that there will be no, well, you, nice try. You, you almost got it. Or there will... There will not be that. This is like where the rubber meets the road. It's perfect for everything. So I'm telling you, no one will be requesting it this year. It will re require extra additional funding to send out a team, okay? So there's, it's gotta be managed in a proper way, and, I, and I'm gonna come up with that, but we have to also make sure when people say we're ready, you're ready. And if you say you're ready, and we're seeing a trend where people really aren't ready, then we'll have to really scrutinize what the requirements will be to request it. But I'm not discouraging you. I'm just saying this is not you going for a check ride and, hey, you, you did a really good job. There's a few things you got to button up on. That, that's a check ride. We're talking, you're saying I'm the best of the best. You're maverick. <laughs> so we're going to... We gotta we gotta aim for the stars, but you got you gotta get a lot of practice. Um, Ron always says perfect practice makes perfect, and that's true, right? If you're not practicing and training to the standard and beyond, then you're probably not. The, the end result is probably not going to bode well for you. The public. When I was at the station, people were filming us all the time. You know, it's, how can I get a police officer? Or not that we're police, but you know, we, we're doing boardings and get the crew out there right away, what, what can we get the most clicks on, right? So just be cogniz cognizant of that. You're out there, a boat sees you, you're in uniform. They don't know the difference between an auxiliary and an active duty person. So 
Keep that in mind. Stay professional the whole time. Be safe. Stay within policy. Just because you're not underway getting a check ride doesn't mean that you go and you know, lock your cleat when you're doing your side toe and you do all these things where your fingers now are close to the cleat. You have to make sure you're following protocol, policy, procedure. That's why it exists. It exists because a mishap happened. They did a mishap investigation and they found out certain things weren't followed. And yes, the old language that they always use, loss of situational awareness, right? That's the old uh, adjective to describe most mishaps in the vessel. So I'm going to get into OFUs, offer for use, because this is important. This is actually where it starts. In OFU, your boat has to look professional, okay? It has to look clean. Um, there's one guy in this room that I talked to the other day, and I said thank you because his boat is immaculate. You could eat off the engine room floor, and I think he knows who it is. <laughs> um, and, that, and, that, and that takes a lot of pride, okay? It takes a lot of pride to do that. Um, I, when, you're, when you're offering these things for use, make sure your registration is up to date. Make sure you're taking a picture of your registration, okay, your new sticker, with the facility sticker. I have facility stickers. If you need one, get one from me um, before you leave today. They are up in my room, so I'll, I'll go back and get those if, if I need to. Um, but we need to make sure that when we're offering for use, we also do what's called a trailering checklist. If you trailer for materials, you trailer for Coasty, you trailer for radio comms, you trailer for a, a boat, you trailer your PWC, everybody has to complete a trailering checklist. All it is is a self-evaluation that you, the owner of the facility, go through to make sure that your vehicle can indeed or should indeed be towing what they're towing. Is it too small of a vehicle? When the RBS-2s came online and replaced the RBS-1s, we had F-350s. When the 29s came, they were heavier and they were a little bit bigger. We had to replace the F-350s with F-450s. So that happens. If you get an upgrade on a boat, you have to make sure that the tongue and the hitch, your tires are within the DOT um, date that you are repacking your wheel bearings. Do you know how often the Coast Guard maintenance procedural card requires our Coast Guard owned trailers to have their bearings repacked? Does anyone know? Annually, annually. So a lot of my maintenance money at Dirox, you heard Rick Weiss up here, he does all that. He doesn't physically do the, the but he'll go and he'll, he'll set it up with the shop to get the bearings repacked, the tires and things like that. So why do I bring this up? Because it's safety. We want to get ahead of what a mishap could potentially do. So these are the things that we're going to do to get ahead of those. The trailering checklist is required once every two years, okay, biannually. So if you offer your, your vessel, your uh, boat facility for use, and you trailer, I'm not going to require you next year in 25 to send in a trailering checklist. You'll have to send another one, an updated one, in in 26, okay? Unless you have a new boat, you get a new vehicle, or something like that uh, comes to fruition, all right? And more important than the mission, right? Why? Because perception is reality. You might be out there kicking butt and taking names, right? But if somebody sees you going way too fast in a no-wake zone, and then you hurt, potentially hurt, or you just come across as a jerk, right? Rule two says don't be a jerk, basically, right? Um, and, and so you, you got to keep these things in mind, all right? You have to have your head on a swivel, and you have to be professional at all times. Next slide. Okay, I'm safe. Am I fit for the mission? All right. Illness, medication, stress, alcohol, drug use, fatigue, and eating. I think, I don't think there's anything on there that is like, oh, I didn't know about that, right? The big thing, alcohol, 12 hours, right? You shouldn't be drinking uh, boo any type of booze within 12 hours of getting underway, okay? That's active duty policy. That's the same policy now for auxiliary. Um, 
the, uh, again, I, I mentioned the trailering uh, checklist, you know, here. That, that's another re way we're going to be safer, um, throwing that in there. Um, next slide. Okay, we got task requirements for crew and coxswain, initial. So the very first thing somebody says is, oh, I'm ready for a check ride, okay? Well, as you remember, Steve Sherman, last year and the year before, as our resident DSOIS, he would vet a bunch and a bunch, a bunch of different people. We'd have this, has everyone seen it? It's the D11 South region uh, checklist. And it's basically just got a bunch of graphs, like coxswain, you know, boom, crew, boom, um, PWC, and he would go through aux data vetting. Do they have their nav rolls? Have they done their TCTRM? Are they current in core training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This year, all across the Coast Guard, here's that word again, standardization. If you are in District 1, District 9, District 14, 17, 11 South, you should be able to go there, 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 and here, and the requirements are exactly the same. We're smaller, right, than a lot of other regions. Because we're smaller, I have taken the liberty to change the requirement up just a smidge. The, the page is found in the manual, the new training handbook, okay? It's enclosure alpha, I believe, to request a check ride. If you are in 10, division 10, you're in division nine, you're in division one, you are going to go through your DSO ops, okay? The ops for your division to vet that, not your FSO, not your flotilla commander, um, not your uh, member training for your flotilla. You're gonna go through your division. We don't have and overwhelming in any way. So that person can reach out to me if they have questions. They're gonna go through aux data. And it doesn't mean they can't use their resources. They can't reach out to their IS, or they, don't, they can't reach out to Steve Sherman. But that form has to be used, okay? We have it printed out. If we can pass that form around, it should be in one of those, one of those envelopes right there. It's not. Okay, it's in the manual then, one of the manuals I gave you right in front of you. So we'll pass that form around, make sure he gets it back. Um, and so I want you guys just to look at it. It, it does look a lot like the one that we produced in-house for D11 South Region and the North had one, but this is the form that has to be used. So why do I bring that up? Because we're in March, folks, right? I am not gonna get check ride requests in September wanting check rides for this year. Yes. We have until December 31st to get check rides done. But you know as well as I do, if you, unless you've been sleeping under a rock, the funding is always an issue come September. So to get ahead of it, I want all check ride requests in by one June. So one June, all check ride requests should be in to uh, your your, uh, your, your, okay, or, or DSO, all right, ops. That person, that DSO op, can work directly with the chief qualification examiner, which is Bob McCoy sitting here in the, in the blue shirt, um, to work through any snags, any snafus. The schedule has been pushed out. It's been pushed out in the activity list. It's been pushed out to all the different QEs. Um, if you didn't get the operational um, op track schedule for this year, when that sign-in sheet is going around, just put a little notation by your name and I'll make sure you get it, okay? So, if somebody says they're ready, okay, and you put that request in by one June, but they haven't, they haven't taken something, well, we're in March. Last time I looked, we got April, May, June. You've got just under three months, two and a half months for them to fix whatever they're deficient in to be eligible to take a check ride, okay? So let's go ahead and be leaders and help them out. 
help them get across the finish line so that they are eligible to, to go ahead and take a check ride. Um, for members' initial qualification, they must meet all the requirements in the appropriate PQS and pass a QE check ride. Okay? So when somebody says, I'm ready for a check ride, but then you look at their PQS and it's not PQS complete, that's a problem. Not on them, it's a problem on the mentor. It's a problem on the person that said, yeah, I'm submitting this up to Bob McCoy because I've vetted them. You gotta look at the PQS, right? You, you gotta make sure you have it done. And there's no harm in saying, you know what? Let's get your PQS done this year. Let's have you get some experience under your belt as a trainee and then next year, we'll get you a QE check ride. There's nothing wrong with that either. This is not supposed to be rush people through. Am I saying, hey, make people do check rides? Like, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you don't have to necessarily push people through just for the sake of making our numbers, bolstering our numbers, okay? That's not what this is about. We want quality, not quantity. We want quality over quantity. There's no requirement to separately submit an annual currency task tracker in the calendar year of an initial qualification. Okay, I'm gonna use Dale. Dale, you're not a coxswain, you're, you're brand new, you're a trainee. Dale takes a check ride this year in division six under Bob McCoy and he passes his check ride. He took his dockside oral, so Bob's gonna ask him a bunch of questions. Satisfactorily, he answers those questions to the liking of the QE. Dale then gets underway and he's evaluated for a check ride. Bob says, yes, you've met the minimum amount of information, Commandant Standards, I'm gonna recommend you for a qualification. Dale, by virtue of doing his check ride, has completed his standardized drills in a safe, proficient manner. Dale does not have to then separately get back underway and do his annual currency maintenance. Is anyone confused by the term annual currency maintenance? Okay, so those annual currency maintenance, we have them printed out here. I encourage you to grab at least one copy today, and what I want you to do with those is I want you to stow them on your facility. I know it's a little hard for PWC operators, maybe you don't have the room, um, but if you can think of a clever way to do it, Fine, if not, just put it in your car, in your glove box, somewhere where you have access to it. Because let's say you get underway and you bring people who don't normally get underway in your boat and you wanna be proactive, not reactive. So you get those sign-offs done. You're like, oh yeah, I did that back in May. Well, don't just say you did it back in May. Take the paper out and get it signed off. If Dale, Dale and John Ross operate frequently together, Dale should sign off John. John should sign off Dale. Most people have the ability, Mike Stockton can sign off Davis Barza. Davis Barza can sign off June. June can sign off Mike, you know. So it, it shouldn't be that you're signing your own stuff. This year I kind of let things slide a little bit because it was our inaugural go for it and um, it, was, it was a little, kind of forced, right, a little, little, little hurry up. So, listen to this date, this is important. If you already are qualified and you took a check ride last year, you have to do annual currency maintenance. And guess what? Yes, it says 31 December. We're not waiting till 31 December. The cutoff date will be 31 August. You gotta have your stuff in to the office by 31 August. Night. You do not have to be a nighttime operator, okay? You do not have to be a nighttime operator. Some people don't feel comfortable at night. You know that on the active duty side, we have what's called area of responsibility runs that we have to get signed off for our currency, which is every six months. We have to go to the different key points of our area of responsibility two times per every six months at nighttime and during the day. Why? Because it looks a lot different at night. Ron, is it different operating at night than during the day? A little bit different, right? 
This guy's, <laughs> he's, Ron's been operating for a, for a long time. Um, actually, Bob, do you remember when we added up all the experience years of the QEs that one time? Was it like 234 years? Like our QE team, and we don't have, what do we have, six? Six QEs? We have 200, there's, not including me, 234 years of experience on the water, uh, being a captain, uh, Ron with, with the Navy. You grew up driving boats at what, 14? You were driving boats? Uh, so you gotta, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to say like we have a good core group of people who, with knowledge. Glean, glean from them, learn from them. Let them be able to be a sponge because we look, especially for, for the, the up and coming coxswains, the future generation of the auxiliary, you guys are gonna carry the torch. And we want that generation after you, you, you know, to be a sponge as well. So nighttime certification, if you do want nighttime certification prior to the new handbook and uh, crew quals guide being released 10 days ago, last two weeks ago, the boat crew uh, person did not have to do a, um, a navigation run. They only had to do a man overboard. Now, both the coxswain and crew have to do, in order to get their night currency, they don't have to do a tow, they don't have to do an anchor, they don't have to do a search pattern, they have to do a navigation run, and they have to do a man overboard. The man overboard can be a direct or indirect pickup. One of the other, not both. Pick whatever you want. Coxon, you're in charge of that. If you feel like your crew is, I, I would recommend you do whatever you're weakest with. Whatever you feel is more appropriate for your AOR. Use critical thinking in determining that. Don't just say, eh, we're gonna do this. You should be good at both, especially if you wanna be, you know, the Operational Excellence Award, but you can determine that. Navigation runs. This is something that I think collectively we're the weakest at. I think we were weakest at two-boat training until this past year. I think people are finally getting it that don't use your, don't use your crew person to pull the boat, okay? Use your boat engine to pull the boat. I think people are finally starting to see that for the most part, and we'll keep working through that. But a navigation run, I was on an op tracks this past summer, last summer. <laughs> I remember that the person put in the waypoint. I said, I want you to go out here. Well, to get from here to there required about five course changes. They took their plotter and they moved it out to that area. And what did it do? It went over land. So he turns, looks to me and says, oh, it goes over land. I know it goes over land. I asked you to put in a nav run. A nav run means do, 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 do. You know, and if you're not sure how to do that, then in March, right now, you need to go to the pier, not while you're underway, go to the pier, turn on the Raytheon, turn on whatever, the Furuno, whatever you've got on your boat, get your old cell phone out and say, there must be a Google video or YouTube video that tells me how do I put in a waypoint and watch it, because that's what we do on the active duty. We have videos and we watch them and we learn and we train. That's a nav run when it says, I'm here, I know I'm gonna do five knots, five knots, 10 knots, 10 knots, and I'm gonna arrive at my ETA because I know how to do what? The three and the six minute rule. So you're using all these tools when we were crawling, when we were walking. And now you're putting them all together in a navigation run. Now you might say, I operate on a lake. We don't have a GPS, we don't have a radar. Okay, BSX, the Office of Boating Safety, when they came up with this, they don't want you to say, well, too bad, so sad, we're gonna make one up. No, you have what you have and you use what you have. If you know that it's a straight shot on a lake or you have a couple of legs, that's where you use the three and the six minute rule. And this little thing called Seaman's Eye, was on a 270 foot ship, my second one. Is anyone familiar with Cape Cod Canal on the Cape? It's a little bit of a shortcut between Boston and New York. And uh, you go through Cape Cod Canal, you don't navigate through Cape Cod Canal, you use Seaman's Eye. This is a 270 foot ship, it's pretty big. 
you literally got a helmsman and you're just going, yep, you're following the contours and you're staying in the middle because you have the phenomenon of bank suction and bank cushion, right? So you can't get too close to the outer edge. You've got the, uh, the rate, you know, you're talking to the, um, the port controller uh, who controls the, the traffic controller who can, who, uh, you know, to let you know that there's no traffic that you're going to find and see there. So there are certain times where you have to use that. So members that want to be nighttime certified and perform nighttime operations, completion of the man overboard and navigation exercise task must be completed at night. When that task is submitted, <coughs> excuse me, it, when that task is submitted up to me, there's a little box in aux data too, and it gets checked. And that box, if it's not checked, and let's say, I'm just looking around for all my night people, I know there's, quite a few in here. Um, you want to bring some crew members and, and that crew member that you're bringing, like let's say, when I say crew member, you have a break-in or a trainee and you have a qualified, but the qualified is not nighttime certified and you're getting underway at night. The OIA is checking that or should be checking that and I help remind them to check that and they they'll push back and say, nope, you're not qualified. Oh, it just came to me. On the it's safe or whatever that slide was, talked about alcohol, talked about rest and everything. We do have something to add into that. Um, and it just slipped my mind again. <laughs> um, on the safety side of it, um, it's super important that we've been doing here. Um, oh, yes. PPE. If you try to get underway and you didn't inspect your PPE gear and you read, you might be qualified as coxswain, you might be qualified as PWC operator, you might be qualified as a crew, crew member. Now, I'm gonna, because I didn't get to do it at the Division Four Change of Watch, we have a rock star in our midst for the PPE Tiger Team Coordinator, and that's Linnea Haas. Linnea Haas killed it for Division Four. She is, I'm sorry for anyone else, it's, Bob, you're good too, but Linnea beat you. <laughs> uh, so, but the, the point of me bringing this up is have a good working relationship with your Tiger Team rep, okay? Because your Tiger Team rep, you're, you're, you, the person that you are bringing with you may have done their inspection, okay, for their gear, but the Tiger Team rep may not have entered it and made them green. So it doesn't always mean that they didn't do it, it just means it didn't get recorded properly in AUX data. Here's the problem, you get underway, that person's PPE gear is out of inspection date and you have a mishap. What do you think they're gonna do? Very first thing they're gonna do is peel back that onion and look at AUX data too, okay? Um, there, it's there for a reason, so make sure it's done. Now, you might ask, how many inspections do you have to do on your PPE gear a year? Two. Well, wait a minute, AUX data two only takes one per year, that's correct. All right, March and October, you should be doing your inspections, okay? March should be the inspection date that's entered into AUX data. I know when we started this, it might be October, but get yourself on the March date, okay? Get yourself on the March date so everybody's on March. Now, yesterday, certain someone came up to me and said, I don't know, I saw someone doing an, doing an inspection on their, their PFD. You can't just willy-nilly do an inspection on your PFD. Oh yeah, it looks good to me. No, there's something called a maintenance procedural card. The maintenance procedural card is in AUX data, okay? I will make sure that that maintenance procedural card gets with a certain someone who may or may not be doing a new reversion of the website or something like that. Um, and it'll be, it'll be very easy for you. It'll say in layman's terms, PFD maintenance. You just click the big old button or something to that effect and it'll bring out the card. And it's so simple, you just follow it, line item by line item by line item. And that's how you go through that piece of gear. The POBs. Remember I sent out in an uh, activity list probably about three, four months ago about the long-term test for the PLB and the short-term monthly test for the PLB? and how you don't do the long-term test monthly, you only do that once a year, because it drains the battery. There's an NPC card, there's a video, there's things that exist that you can go off of, okay? So, members 
not requesting to be night certified are not required to complete the man overboard and navigation exercise. Duh, is it, right? They don't want to be uh, nighttime certified. That's fine. You don't have to be. You can operate during the day, but you just can't get underway as a qualified coxswain, crew member, um, et cetera. <clears throat> um, they must complete the task during the day to complete the PQS, okay? So, um, let me read that again. So, requirements at night as part of the qualification process to complete the PQS, all right? So, they must complete these tasks during the day to complete the PQS. All right, next slide. Okay, currency maintenance requirements consist of the following. Annual underway tasks, annual underway hours, three-year evaluation by a QE, the TCTRM every 15 months. I, I'm going to say it again. The TCTRM is the second most important thing that you have to do on a recurring basis after NAV rules, okay? I can't and won't give... Nobody on active duty will ever get a waiver for NAV rules. You might say, well, I didn't know my NAV rules was expiring. No one told me. You got this awesome application system called AuxData 2. You also have a brain that says, I know who my IS officer is. Heck, if you don't, just, hey, Steve Sherman, help me out. Give me a report that shows when I next have to do my NAV rules, when I next have to do my TCT, when I next have to do my core training. And keep it on your refrigerator. All right, it's coming up. Oh, you know what? I need to get a proctor, and only QEs can do a proctor. Okay, so now I need to get with a QE in the coming months, and I'm going to get my NAV rules, my deck watch officer proctored. Okay, so people will ask me, can I get a waiver on TCTRM? No. You do get a waiver. You get three months. It's due every 12 months with a three-month grace period built into it. Okay, so there's no waiver for TCTRM. Um, NAV rolls every five years. So, <clears throat> auxiliary training handbook, boat crew, ATH, BC, chapter five for detailed currency maintenance requirements for crew member, coxswain, and PWC operator. Those guides are, are right here. They're printed out. Um, on a break, you can, you can thumb through them and, and check them out if you, you want to look at that chapter five here. Next slide. Annual currency task requirements, the task tracker, enclosure four, five, and six in the auxiliary training handbook. Uh, boat crew must, complete, uh, must be completed by all coxswain's crew and PWOs and submitted to the appropriate uh, designee to be recorded in OxData. That's me, not Steve Sherman, even if I choose to kick it to Steve Sherman. When you're contacting the shared inbox, it's not, hey, Steve, do this for me, copy the shared inbox. It's send it to the shared inbox, and I will look at it, and I will farm it out if I so desire. You shouldn't be emailing Steve directly. This is, this is for me to look at because what we had a snafu that happened uh, last week where, for some reason, our emails older than 90 days were not showing up. It's a glitch. They'll come back. I bring that up because somebody from last year submitted their annual currency maintenance as they should have. The issue was I couldn't get to it even though I saved it in a folder. Well, there's something that, because it was all new and it, and, and it was kind of, and there's a little bit of ambiguity regarding it. But now if Dale, if you submit your annual currency maintenance for 2024 next week, not only do I I get it, not only does it get entered into aux data, I take your actual PDF, and I've done this for Al already, and multiple people, you've, and I upload it into your profile. So if you're a coxswain, and I can click on your coxswain in aux data too, it'll say files or whatever, and I can upload the physical form. So when the secret police at, uh, there are other auxiliaries that go by, uh, admin user 42 and all these other people and you, what the heck, someone turned the lights off on me. I'm REYR, I'm rework. They're checking that stuff. 
Well, now, there's no ifs, ands, buts about it. You sent it in. I'm not even requiring this to go in your, your uh, record anymore because it's in Aux Data. I'm literally uploading it into Aux Data, just like an offer for use, how we upload files into Aux Data. Same thing with the trailering checklist. The trailering checklist will go into your offer for use profile that says, yeah, you know what? I thought about it. I, I, I looked at my trailer hitch. Um, I'm good to go. I, I put it in. So <clears throat> that, this way, if there's ever an issue, it's, it's there. It exists, OK? So on the active duty side, I, I think it's important to, to say this. You might say, man, well, why? they're making it so confusing. They've actually made it really easy, and I'll explain. On the active duty side, you have to literally input every individual tasks that you do for your currency. Man overboard, AOR run, anchoring, da da da. Here with you guys in Aux Data, it's all lumped into day, and it's all lumped into night, because we're not trying to make it hard. But then that sheet that you hand in is your attestation saying, yeah, I did it, here's proof, and then I up upload it. And it's as simple as that. So 31 December is the national date. The date for us is 31 August. 31 August, that's plenty of time to get it done. Plenty of time. Some of you have already turned yours in. I think Al turned his in. Some of you are, are, are way ahead of the, the ball game on this, so good job. Oh, the point is, all these copies here that you take, when your uh, Division 10 is up next, their, their check ride is in three weeks, two weeks, something like that, have all this stuff there, and then it's like, yep, you're good, yep, you're good, because you're doing the standardized man overboard, standardized towing, standardized grounding. So let's talk about that real quick. Grounding and fire, those are called Beckys, basic engineering casualty control exercises. They want you, if you go fast to ground, oh, we're, we're ground, what do you do? Standardize action and reaction to that issue. What have I been preaching since day one? That is reassess GAR, reassess GAR, reassess GAR. Remember, use critical thinking. You have a man overboard. Hey, Sally, just stay there while we reassess GAR. No, pick up your man overboard, make sure they're okay. But at the end of the day, when you're going to brief who has your radio guard, yes, we updated GAR. Does not mean, let's sit here for a half hour and talk through it again. No, that means you take your sheet of paper that you wrote down your GAR score on and you go back through and say, all right, this was our highest number. Do we want to change anything? And if everyone says, let's change one thing and that's this, and you're all in agreement to it, that's reassessing GAR. You just acknowledge that you need to reassess it. You recorded it. You passed it on. And it's documented. So if there's a mishap investigation, you followed common on policy of reassessing GAR and doing GAR, okay? If a member wishes to maintain night certification, they also are required to complete the nighttime annual currency. We know that, uh, man overboard exercise, document completion of their annual currency maintenance task tracker. The annual currency maintenance task tracker must be completed and submitted every year to include those years with the three year evaluation by a QE, okay? Guess what? You can do that at your qualification exercise, okay? So you have a, you're, you're due for your, how many people uh, were due for a check ride in 2022 and had a check ride in 2022? That's the majority of you. No, yeah, the majority of you are 22. That means you're due in 25. Next year, we have a lot of people to get through, okay? There was, I want, just in, some of you talk to national staff, okay? There was a rumor that was going around, and the rumor was because there's so many people due in 2025, like they were due in 2022, that they're going to get an extra year for their check ride. That is not true. Absolutely not true. If you were last given a check ride in 22 and you passed it, three years later, you're due next year in 2025. 
It's going to be a very busy year, so expect the schedule for the op tracks to come out early. Expect it to be probably mixed a little bit with we want to go for the Operational Excellence Award, coupled with new people, coupled with people in REYR. So it's going to be a very, very, very busy year, okay? Um, so be prepared for it and be ready. Next slide. Okay, these are the tasks right here. Um, Ron's gonna get into some of this with the actual drill sheets. So, um, nothing, nothing other than, let's see, onboard fire and then the grounding. Um, as I said, the nav run, really hone in on that. Get, get your crew member to the pier if you are outfitted with a GPS, with a plotter, get familiar with it. In year one, when we were crawling, we were just asking simple stuff. How do you, how do you, press, how do you press your man overboard button? How do you depress it? How do you, uh, where's your uh, sound signal, right? Things that, if the coxswain becomes incapacitated, you would hope that the crew person knows how to do that. Well, now we're gonna get a little bit more into it. Now you gotta know how to turn it on how to put in a route, et cetera, et cetera. For me, if I'm a coxswain and I'm operating and I'm doing an av run, I'm putting my crew member on the helm and I'm giving them courses, okay? Come right, steer course, zero, three, zero, okay? And, and that's how I'm doing my nav run, just like I would do a, a Victor Sierra or an expanding square, okay? Not required, but that, that's just how I'm doing it. I think that's the best way to do it. Uh, plus, it gets your crew member more experienced at the helm, and it um, gives them the ability to prove that if you become incapacitated, they can get that boat safely navigated. Next slide. Conduct a pre-check uh, off of an auxiliary facility. Navigation exercise, same thing. Correctly execute one of, the, one of the precision search patterns in accordance with the search pattern precision evaluation drill sheet or correctly execute one of the drifting search patterns in accordance with the search pattern uh, drifting evaluation drill sheet. One of, yep, here it is. Search patterns shall be based on appro appropriateness of the patterns for the type of facility and the needs of the operating area. So what that means is on a lake, we're not going to be doing, you know, a creeping search or, you know, a Papa Sierra. Like, y y we can barely get through a Victor Sierra with the traffic. Oh, you guys dropped your life ring. How many times have that happened to us, right? And it's like, ah, oh, come on, that was our datum, datum, now we gotta do this again. So, just keep that in mind. We want you to be successful, but remember for the Operational Excellence Award, if you wanna bring out the big guns, we're gonna bring out the big guns and you have to know how to do, do it, okay? And do it well, do it perfect. Next slide. Locate and identify the, the purpose of the equipment aboard the boat. Again, <clears throat> this is the time where you're pulling out your flares. This is the time where you're showing crew that you operate with all the time. I know there's a lot of people that operate with Dave Vadbunker at Channel Islands, a lot of people that operate with Al. There's a lot of people that operate with Gary Nelson. Um, you know, there's a lot of different people that operate. Sal, you, you usually operate with Boz on his boat. So there's, there's a lot of um, people who, who have boats that they, some people operate with Al and Dave Vadbunker. I know Lori Barfield's one of them. Um, so you need to become familiar with the boat outfit equipment now. You're going through that equipment with a fine tooth comb now and the expectation for me, for the QEs, is that you know that stuff. Not you get to the boat an hour before your check ride and you've never been on the boat and now you're like, oh, oh, well, they're only gonna ask me the key stuff. And that is true, but it'll come out in the course of the check ride that you have no clue what you're doing, okay? As far as the equipment goes. Now, let me be clear. For the purpose of the check ride, we are not gonna spend two hours at the pier watching you go through stuff that you should already know. On the active duty side, every single morning they do this thing called boat checks. Every morning. We do it on the small boats, on, the, on board a cutter, we do it at the small boat station. We go through the boat outfit list. 
we go through the equipment, we test it, we make sure it works, we do a, uh, uh, comms check. We do. We pull out. You know all the all the things. We don't do that when we have a SAR case and say, "All right, person taken on water, burning babies in the surf. Just wait. We're going to go through our boat outfit list." It's not what we do. Again, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, and it doesn't mean that you don't have to know it. But the appropriate time for you to become familiar with your GPS chart plotter your Stokes litter if you have one on board, whatever you might have that's different on your facility, you do that stuff now, well in advance of your check ride. So when your check ride happens, we want to hear the heavy hitters. Where's your EPIR? Where's your damage control kit? Okay? Um, stuff like that, okay? A quick, brief overview. I've, if I've never been on your boat or I've only been on your boat a handful of times, Give me some emergency procedures. Do you have a, uh, an installed, um, you know, halon in your engine room or something like that? Like, let me know, where's the, where's the cutoff switch for that? That's the stuff that I need to know within, you know, a quick five minute brief. Um, but we're not pulling out the flares and saying, well, the, the rise and fall and the color and the characteristics of, we're not doing that, okay? That, that is stuff that you should know, all right? So perform underway, pre-underway testing, conduct pre-underway briefings. The crew member, if they're doing the GAR, they should know what they're doing, okay? They should not be looking over to the cocks and saying, am I, am I doing this right? No, have some confidence, practice, practice well in advance before we get there, and talk about mitigation. What is mitigation? It's trying to take a high or higher score, maybe a medium, maybe a high, and get it lowered because perhaps there were things that you didn't consider, there were things that you thought about, or maybe there's things that people didn't realize until the most junior person spoke or the most senior person spoke or whatever. There's always ways that you can it's the STAR method, spread out, transfer, avoid, accept, reduce, right? That's what you're trying to do. Do we have to go? Do we have to go now? Can somebody else go? You know, that, that's what you're trying to think through your, through your head there. It's an ongoing process the entire time you're underway. Um, <clears throat> for PWC, dismount and remount. Um, so we are gonna have a PWC roundup in September, okay? We're also gonna have various parts of the AOR where it's needed. We're gonna have certain people travel to help train up on PWC. I will be at the Roundup in September. Um, next slide. Okay, three year evaluation check ride must be completed uh, no later than 31 August. Okay, required three years from the completion of the last QE check ride. Annual currency maintenance tasks are not required to be completed prior to the member's three year evaluation check ride. Why? Because annual currency maintenance tasks are not required to be completed prior to the member's three year evaluation check ride. Because you're probably going to be doing, you are going to be doing, because you're gonna work smarter, not harder. You're gonna have that form and you're gonna say, hey, I just did that toe and Ron said I did a good job. Hell froze over. <laughs> uh, so you get it signed off and uh, so see this, this is what I like about my job. I can bust on Ron. Ron's a good sport, he really is. And, and you know what, his passion and his drive is, is second to none. So uh, I appreciate it. Nighttime tasks are, are an optional part of the QE three year evaluation check ride for those members that are night certified. Remember, if you want to do the holiday parades, okay, and we are not launching from Newport. We're launching from, from uh, uh, Huntington, and we'll go down that way, okay? So we'll, 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 we'll look at some of those things. All right, next slide. Okay, when a member fails to meet any of the currency maintenance requirements, their certification will lapse, they will be placed in um, required yearly REYR. No, nobody knows what the heck REYR stands for. It's just rears, right? Um, reference, uh, uh, Auxiliary Training Handbook, um, Chapter 6, for details on recertification requirements for, for all three, right? PWC, Coxon, and crew. 
A uh, member who fails to meet annual currency maintenance requirements day or night, task and hours for a calendar year shall make up the missing hours and or tasks as a trainee the following calendar year to recertify. We all get that, right? So if you are underway, you have a qualified coxswain, not in REYR, and a qualified crew member, not in REYR. And you, because you're in REYR, do this missing tasks under their purview, and then it, when it's satisfactory, you submit the, the form to me via the shared inbox, and we turn the lights back on, and all is good. If you noticed, we're trying to build our facility fleet, okay? So I'm gonna take this quick moment to do a plug for something on facility rela related thing. Um, if you are in a division that is trying to rebuild, and, and many of you are, and I appreciate that. I'm not gonna punish you if there's not a qualified coxswain or a crew, but you have a facility and you're bringing it online. In fact, I think that's awesome. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring, whether it's a QEs or if I can find some coxswains out there, and I'm gonna bring them in to fulfill those duties so that crew that's REYR can train under them and the lights can be turned back on for them. There's something in, and, and some of you are gonna see this, hear about it from National, or read it yourself, and I'm just gonna tell you, I have the ability, as every OTO does, to be more stringent, but not less stringent than the Commandant policy, which is what we're looking at here on the table. There's some language in the book that says, if you don't have enough facilities, you can use a facility that used to be a facility that's not a facility. So in other words, it's not a facility anymore. You can go and do two boat training with them. But I have to come up with a policy and put that in place. We're not doing that. We are not doing that, okay? Not in D11 South. We have enough facilities to do two boat training. We've made it work for three years. We were way worse off three years ago than we are now. I have my reasons. I'm not gonna waste your time. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I have my reasons for that. We're not doing that. So there's some language in there that talks about using other government agency boats. It talks about using people's boats that used to be a facility that are not a facility anymore. Bottom line up front, all of you are striving or you have strived to getting, staying current as a coxswain even when this new stuff came out. It's a daunting task and you get rewarded for that. I'm not rewarding people that didn't get off their for whatever reason, they didn't want to do it, all right? They have their reasons, that's fine. But we've got enough, we got enough facilities, we're good to go, okay? Um, next, uh, next slide. Um, medical, uh, we, we know about TCT, uh, we know about NAV rules. Um, the medical, remember, no, there are no, um, waivers for TCT and navigation rule. If you go over that 15 month period, I will not give you a waiver and I will not give you a waiver for NAV rules. Again, I wouldn't give my BM2 at a station a waiver. They get what's called in-house suspension. Because if you, if you completely remove them, now they have to go through all of the tasks again. Every single boat crew task they have to do again. They have to do a check ride, they have to do a board. So what you do is, it's called in-house suspension you basically turn the lights off for their, their qual, and then when they, pass, they successfully pass their Navarro's test, you might take them out and, and do something that is either random, if, if they're a terrific coxswain and they just let it lapse, you might, let's do a tow, or let's do an AOR run. You just pick something, and they have to redo something, just so you can say, yep, they satisfied the mail, you know, they met the requirement, let's turn the lights back on. Medical situations of a temporary nature are defined as conditions that preclude a certified member from boat operations for a period of not more than one year. One year is defined as 365 days from the date the member is placed in admin status in Ox Data 2. Listen, HIPAA's a thing, okay? And you shouldn't be broadcasting whatever you got going on to the world, but you can send me an email, you can call me, whatever the case may be, if you wanna share, hey, I got this surgery coming up, I got this thing, I'm gonna be out of commission for 250 days, thereabouts. 
okay, I can mark it on my calendar, let's follow up with, with Joe Bob and see if they're okay. So I can take them out of admin status and then see if they have enough time to get back into it. So the point is, is it's on you. You know your body, you know if you're well, if you're not well, you know if your vision has gone, right? If, if, you're, if you pass the eye test, but then next year, you're like, yeah, I barely passed it, now I, I don't. You gotta, you gotta speak up and say something. And for all of you wondering about the vision test, people memorizing like the letters and stuff like that, don't do that because we're smarter than you. And I'll tell you why. Because when you're out in the boat and I, and I tell you, hey, give me that number on that buoy, and I tell you, hey, give me that number over here, we're gonna find out that you foobarred that thing. And, 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 and so don't, just don't do it, be honest, all right, be honest. So, next slide. All right, Navarro's 95 for coxswains only, core training, underway mission hours, currency maintenance tasks, qualification examiner check ride, risk management, service operations workshop, which you're doing today. Um, this will get put out. Um, uh, Chris will do his amazing work. He'll probably take out the part about the eyeball, um, hopefully. Uh, and then uh, we can make this sound good, put it out. Because it's 33 slides, we're not gonna like pick key players to be able to get this out to everybody. People can just watch it. Um, they can email the shared inbox. You can email the shared inbox. I'm looking into the camera if there's something I didn't cover that you have a question on and I'll gladly answer it. Um, yeah, next slide. Uh, this is our training handbook, new version, um, February 21st, 2024. I sent a sign up sheet. You will get an email of this. I will try to send you, it's weird because somehow the ones that hit the street a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, it said draft, but it just was a watermark that wasn't removed. So there is another version out there that doesn't have draft, and I think it's actually on the chief director's website under SOPs and handbooks. But I didn't print that one. I printed the one that I saved to my desktop, which had the draft on there. So anyway, if you see that, it's still legit, even though it says draft. But you really should print out, if you're going to print out, the one that doesn't have the, the draft language on there. Next, next slide. Um, this is the, the website that's revised. I want to basically have something very similar to this. Bosa mates like big colors and simple words, me, me click, right? And then you, 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 you click on it and, and, and you know, standardized drill sheets. Well, crap, that's, that's, that's what Ron's gonna cover. So, oh wait, Ron had them printed out, but I, but I didn't get a copy. Ooh, you can go here, but we're also gonna have a big, beautiful thing on our website that will do the same thing. So coming to a theater near you, next slide. Here's the QR code, if you wanna come up, you can do this now. If you don't want to, that's fine as well. We can go back to it on break. Um, next slide. Uh, let's see, changes. We'll, 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 we'll get to it on break. You guys weren't fast enough. Uh, okay. So I, I went over this, right? <clears throat> I talked about this. If we didn't update it to a process guide, we'd be sitting at 2039 before it got updated again, okay? So we want it to be three editions, right? This is great, I'm, I'm liking it, you know? Hey, keep updating, keep making it better, keep making it better. Um, I'll let Ron and, well, they, they can speak to some, I, I can speak to some of it because I, I talk to Master Chief Park quite a bit at BSX, I talk to my fellow OTOs, We have a long way to go, we do, right? Crawl, walk, run, and then to be operational excellent. And that's a great goal to strive for. But I will say that 99% of everybody, when I came here as OTO and we said, you know what? Why wait two or three years for this stuff to actually happen? Like we're gonna start getting out there and doing this stuff. You guys had a great attitude about it and 
at least some of the stuff I shared with Master Chief Park, and I think uh, Bob McCoy and Ron can say the same thing. I think we're, I think we're light years ahead of most people in most areas. So I personally, from you guys, at least maybe I have my ears plugged, haven't heard you complaining or throwing darts at my face because of all this new stuff. But that says a lot about your, your work ethic. It says a lot about your attitude because attitude and effort are the two things you can control. You can't control the policies necessarily that get put out there, but your attitude and your effort you can control and I've seen nothing but, you know, for, for the most part. There's some, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, the operator, claimant, owner, whatever, get them submitted and if you don't see the OIA taking action on it, do you guys get an email from the, like, does it automatically email you when the OIA sends it to FinCEN? If you're not getting that in a day, email her. Email Bentel, all right, and get that information in because we shouldn't be waiting on this. There's admirals at the end of the year, and they are not happy when they see auxiliaries spending their own money and not getting reimbursed. And sometimes it's our own faults why we're not doing that. Get reimbursed. Go for it, all right? Get, get those patrol orders in. Um, updated reimbursement claim submission for patrol orders from 30 days to 15 calendar days, increased time from alcohol consumption. Um, okay. Again, 15, from 30 days to 15 days, I think, uh, I think you should get it in within a day or two. There's no reason to be waiting 15 days. Because the, the issue isn't so much now, the issue is towards the end of the year. Because how many people have honestly forgotten about a patrol order it just it happens right come on I know some of you have all right there we go uh, thank you for your honesty the point is I'm not trying to throw you under the bus at all but that's why it happens because we just wait all right we procrastinate just just go ahead and take care of it get yourself reimbursed you deserve it okay all right waivers um I think Ron is going to cover that, or at least he's got the exact verbiage in the manual, or Bob can, or bottom line is, you're done. You're done. That is a new policy. We're, we're going back to the pier. We're, so in the active duty side, you have different um, casualties. You have disabling, restricted, a major, and a minor. Disabling casualties are like you lose an engine. So you have the other engine. And a classic officer in charge review board question used to be, oh, you have burning babies in the surf and you just lost your engine. Well, the policy says I have to go to the nearest safe haven. If that means I have to turn around and go five miles back to the station where I launched from, that's where I gotta go. Well, the clever move is you turn around doing a long, lazy swoop. And while you do that, you pick up the burning babies in the surf and go back to the station, right? So there's clever ways of doing it, but Disabling casualty, you got to get back. Restricted casualties require waivers, okay? And those waivers are going to, you guys are most of the time operating out there not doing emergent SAR, okay? If you're on a patrol doing a mom patrol, you are not, capital N-O-T, going to get a waiver for a restricted issue on your boat. Get it, get it into the shop, get it looked at, get it fixed. That's the bottom line. If you don't think it's gonna run for your op tracks, don't even try it, okay? PPE waivers, um, that's gonna be through your OIA. Now, there's a difference, a major difference between the LA OIA and the San Diego OIA. Kevin Bentel is two and a half years removed from a commanding officer job at Station Castle Hill where Kevin Bentel used to provide PPE waivers for his crew. He knows all about it. Taylor Gibbons does not. So Kevin Bentel has the ability to adjudicate that, even though he's going to let Captain know, hey, I, I made this decision. Taylor does not have that ability because she is not, she's never been a CO and she doesn't have that, that experience or knowledge. So she's going to go and work with directly with Captain Manning in the command center. So again, 
We're not just going to be, oh, PPE waiver, PPE waiver. It's, that's not what this is meant for. In the rare case where you absolutely have to get underway, where the water temp is under 60 degrees, it will be a case-by-case -case basis, okay? Um, added crew endurance uh, management fatigue. There's a chart. Uh, next slide. I think, okay, this is what we talked about. Next slide. That's on the d11s.org website under surface operations, this crew endurance management. Um, next slide. Okay, crew fatigue time computation. This is what it counts towards 100% for underway time and anchor pre and post mission activity codes 50%. Stops and breaks, 50%, trailering, 50%, and then standby times, 50%. So crew fatigue time computation begins when the crew reports to the designated place to prepare for a specific mission. Computation, computation of such time ends when the mission is complete. If you're trailering, how many miles can you trailer per day? And it comes from the Army, but it's the Coast Guard adapted it. It's 350 miles that you can travel per day. If you have somebody else that can drive the car, then you're able to do 700 miles, right? But that's, the Coast Guard adapted that also with trailering, okay? And it's eight hours or 350 miles. So if you drive slow in eight hours, you gotta, you gotta stop. Now, the good news is, I think from Phoenix to Morro Bay, it might be just about 350 miles, but that trip I have never seen happen, nor will it probably happen. But if it does, like we, we, can, we can look at this and consider it. Next slide. This is the, the graph I was looking at to go back to the fatigue hours. Doesn't matter if it's less or more than 30 feet, it's eight hours, okay? With seas less than four feet. Seas greater than four feet, um, I'm gonna be talking to the OIA because depending on what you're doing, you shouldn't be getting underway for the most part. Like, unless, you're going to a SAR case where the active duty doesn't exist, but you just want to get underway just because, or a mom patrol, like, this is why we, we do our TCTRM, okay? Now, there's different size facilities, you know, if we're talking the Triton versus, uh, what's your bad boy's name? Easy does it. You know, obviously, there's a little bit of difference in the size of the vessel, all right, the facility. Oh, there's, there's the trailer. 350 miles or eight hours on the bottom there. Okay, next slide. Okay, mishaps, we've talked about those. Um, so the one thing I'll add on the mishap part, and we're almost done guys, so thanks for your attention. Um, the L2 message that came out last year, if you haven't seen it, there's a requirement, a reporting requirement for any coxswain to not only, I get, I'm okay with it, I'm not gonna complain, people will often call me for a mishap. Technically, I'm outside of the mishap. I'll know about it, but I should be briefed from the OIA within 48 hours. The OIA should be briefed within 24 hours to determine what it is. And the Safety and Environmental Health Manual has a list Thing of what that mishap could be. So we have a op has, operational hazard. So we had a person that, that slipped, fell partly in the drink, and uh, we had to call that an operational ha uh, hazard, an op has. Wasn't a mishap, but the reporting mechanism in the L2 message requires that coxswain of that, crew, of that boat, that facility, to report to the chief of staff, which is Rod Donahue, and Rod uh, reports it to the, to the Commodore and to the Dean Aco, Mary um, Kirkwood. And what that does is it says if there's a mishap or incident. So you can't say, well, that's not technically a mishap, so I'm not reporting it. No, it's an incident. Falling partially in the drink. Is, is it's an incident. It's not a mishap because it's an operational hazard according to the definition, but you still got to report it. When in doubt, punt it up, okay? When in doubt, kick it up. So there's two different mechanisms is my point. I'll make sure that L2 message is posted on the new website, but you have to get that L2 message sent up 
um, or, or the requirements, and there's a flow chart, and it tells you reach out to Rod Donahue. So, all right, next slide. Um, we went over this. Next slide. That's safety and environmental health manual, by the way, the commandant instruction. Uh, next manual, or next slide. Um, <coughs> SAMA, okay, we got, we got a 20% increase in 2023, first increase in many years. That's kudos to Master Chief Park. Um, he's a, if you haven't met him, he's, he's a pretty funny guy. Um, <laughs> He, he, he actually got that um, for, for the auxiliary. Um, so, SAM is meant to reimburse facility owners for routine wear and tear expenses. It's not intended to cover all costs involved in owning a facility, right? Because that would then have auxiliaries, unfortunately, being, hey, I'm going to be a facility just to make money. It's not a business, right? You guys are doing the Coast Guard a solid, right? And by the way, if I, if I get a facility, one of the things that I look for, if I, if I get an offer for use and I know the person's only trying to use it one or two times a year and they're making money on it rather than losing money on it, I'm probably going to really evaluate that. You know, um, The other thing is, can it be used for the purpose of, of what the Coast Guard's looking for? If it can't, I'm probably going to say no. Okay, next slide. Hawk Scout, this is what I was talking about. I'll just turn it over to Paris. <laughs> uh, next slide. You guys will have a chance to come up and QR code it. Uh, response articles. The response directorate needs your help in showcasing your operations. Do you have some photos and a couple of sentences about an event or a mission? Let's create articles for the response, that's spelled wrong, uh, directorate to share your good work. Uh, Michelle Thornton is the what? Uh, former former Commodore or the Commodore? Okay, and then she is like the national QE, if you will, of sorts ish. Um, so I get these emails about these monthly meetings or quarterly meetings, and they come from her. So I think she is somehow plugged in. She's got Master Chief Park's ear, like because Master Chief Park. We were looking at the uh, ops workshop that got sent out like a month and a half ago. It was the wrong version that was on there at the time and it got plucked. And then it got redone because what happened? The new manuals came out and changed that. So I reached out to Mastery Park and he reached out to Michelle and Michelle reached out to somebody and then they sent out something. So I will also email you that one that has this workshop that they sent out and it should be in the proper location but you'll get that link of where it's at um al if you have pictures of your your day more pictures I'm, they're probably going to do an article for for your uh thing but you know don't sit there driving a boat taking pictures but if you're doing two boat with the with the with the station or you're doing two boat with another facility and you have you can bring somebody extra on board or you have a trainee who's not the lookout, try to, try to you know, get some pictures and make it happen. But again, if you have a Aton verifier on board your boat, the Aton verifier is not your boat crewman, they're not your lookout, they're not your coxswain. They're completely independent from your crew and they're using the app on their phone. Perfectly acceptable. If you're going by a party boat and they all have their cameras out, you may want to put the phone down and the app down. That's just called good judgment, okay? Be aware of your surroundings. Um, that is all I've got. I'll take some questions real quick. Um, but again, Bob and Ron are up next. They're going to cover a lot of this stuff. It's 930. Um, we've got, they're, they're probably not going to be more than a half hour each with 15 minutes of Q&A. And then we'll get Gene in here and be, be on the road. Um, they're just going to cover some of this stuff more in depth of what I went over. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so <clears throat> that is, that's all I have. I know some of this stuff is dry. Thank you for your attention.